For everybody who's joined, welcome. Thank you very much for taking this time out of your day, whether it's your afternoon or your evening, depending on where you're calling from. We, we did something like this similar two weeks ago uh, as part of Digital Irish, where we had just a community gathering of people coming together and we put forward questions and had opportunities for people to network in small groups and get to know each other. And we're going to follow through with something similar today, but we're going to break it up with two different speakers. And I'll introduce them in just a moment. Um, but just to give you an insight into what we're doing, the, for anybody who's been part of Digital Irish and gone to our events, it's, it's all about providing some value through experts in different domains, innovators in different areas. For those of you who've listened to the podcast or are not aware of it, we've got a, a podcast, the Digital Irish podcast, where every three weeks we release an episode which features an established entrepreneur or corporate innovator. And they share their story of how they came to this moment in life, how they came through their journey to create, to innovate, uh, to often expand outside the Isle of Ireland and to, to make an impact on the industry which they work in. And we also feature startups who share their story of what they're building and have an ask in each episode for the community of how we can support them. And as far as I can see on today's call, we have, uh, well, we have Donal Hernan, who's going to be speaking in a little bit. He was our most recent guest on the podcast. And we have Mary McKenna on here, and she will be released in, a, in, about, in about five or six weeks uh, in an upcoming episode. So... If you want to check that out, you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. And in addition, what we're doing in this virtual space, um, we've been rolling out some master classes. So this is very much so an interactive experience, but to add to that, we've been doing master classes with experts in different domains to provide some insight in their field or to help you at this moment of time where there may be some, some great changes. So we had a masterclass on, on recruiting, I, I'm, you know, searching for a job. We had one last Friday and we have two masterclasses lined up, one of which is happening on May 1st with Cahill McCabe from Soft Automotive. And he's going to be talking about robotic process automation. And then we have a second one on May 8th with Ashling Spittle from People.ai. And she's going to be speaking about account-based marketing. And both of those are happening at 10 a.m. Eastern time. So you'll be able to sign up for those. We'll be sending out emails and uh, you'll be able to partake and, and find hopefully some value in the relevance of what they can share. But to bring us and ground us into today and what we're talking about, the, the topic is creating a culture of innovation for digital transformation. And the way that today is going to roll out is we're going to break it up into two 15-minute talks. So to begin with, we're going to have a talk on this side of the Atlantic in the U.S., where Marianne Pierce is going to speak with Donal Hernan. Marianne is, is a board member of Digital Irish, and Donal Hernan is a director at Nokia Bell Labs, which is one of the, the leading research and development institutions uh, historically that the world has ever seen. And, and he does a lot of work on experiments in art and technology. And as I mentioned, he was our most recent guest on the podcast. And if you want to dive deeper into what we'll, we'll be discussed today, you'll be able to hear it on that conversation. And after that, we're going to go into a breakout session where we'll all get to meet each other or in little groups for about five minutes, which is a, a lovely experience in this virtual world. And then we're going to hear from Louise O'Connor and she's going to be speaking with Jack Stenson. Um, Louise O'Connor is from Beta Digital and is also a director of Ireland Together, which was uh, recently developed and we'll be discussing what Ireland Together is hoping to accomplish. And similarly, after that, we'll all get to connect and go into little groups to have a discussion afterwards. So this is not just going to be an experience where you're consuming, but you'll be participating and you'll be part of this throughout. But to begin with, we're going to move into our first conversation where I'll pass the mic virtually over to Mary Ann Pierce, and uh, you can open up the conversation with Donald. Well, thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. And welcome, everyone from the UK, from Dublin, from New York City, all across the country. Don't know if we have anybody from Asia, but that would be great if you do. Maybe in the chat, when we go into a breakout, let us know if you're from anywhere that's not in the, the tri-state area or the tri-country area. Um, it's, we, um, we did our first Zoom meeting um, uh, last week. And it was really basically uh, for Digital Irish to reach out to our members just to check in, how are you doing? 
you know, like just a real sort of a, a virtual hug and handshake. However, I got over enthusiastic and sent a Twitter out to uh, my, my friends in the UK and Dublin saying, come all ya and join us, not realizing that a seven o'clock New York event was midnight. Um, we had about six people that came on to it, Suzanne Doyle and of course Louise O'Connor, uh, Suzanne Hayes Cullion. And then I got chastised by a number of people saying this is past my bedtime. So we decided let's try this New York lunchtime. It basically a sandwich here in New York and a, a beverage in the UK and Ireland to see if we can continue to broaden our, our, our connections, our diaspora, and really continue the whole uh, the forward uh, mo motion that Digital Irish is devoted to is promoting innovation and Irish innovators. So just when we said, well, who can we have on the show? I said, well, why don't we just call upon Dumnal Heron? Um, he is our recent podcast um, interviewee, and I've known Dumnal for many years, about five or six years, primarily from Inspirefest, uh, Masters in Robots, Singularity U, and Warsaw, and most recently now working with Digital Irish and Patrick doing, um, doing the um, podcast. And Duno has just been on that edge of, uh, you know, uh, besides just being a master musician from a family, traditional family of, a, a, if you've ever seen, if you've seen his LinkedIn, he has 300 likes for playing in air about a week ago. So that's more than I think any of us, except for Mary McKenna, probably got a like on that. And then is also a trained engineer at Nokia Bell Labs. So um, Duno, welcome. Welcome to the show, as they would say in TV. How are you? Hey, master musician. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been called that before, but I appreciate it. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, uh, as as we we're just, you know, from what we heard and I think what we're all experiencing, we're in this moment of crisis, and crisis can be also a moment of opportunity, great pain, but opportunity. And so when we're here, what do we need to do differently to get into the, the next world? I mean, we don't, don't know how, took an umbrage when I said the new normal. And he said, let's just talk about how can we promote a culture of innovation? So I'm going to ask you that question, Dumno, in all your experience, what is and how do you create a culture of innovation? Sure. Uh, great to chat with everyone. Thanks for joining. You know, I think a lot about innovation. I've kind of lived my whole professional life in the innovation space. And I get a little bit worked up when I hear people talking about innovation and calling things innovative. And I kind of have this new mantra or this question I ask myself or a statement I make, which is, is if everything is innovative, then surely nothing is. So the reason I say that is because every new release of a smartphone or every new release of a wearable or every new release of a online cycling gadget or exercise thing, they're all good, it's all new products, it's something different in the world, but is that really innovation and should innovation be something different than incremental or just the next thing? And I think innovation has become one of the most overused buzzwords of our time. And uh, the reason I get a little bit worked up about it is because if we're calling everything innovative, then we're diluting the power of innovation to actually transform humanity. And that's the real reason that I get a little bit worked up about it. So I think the very first thing to do is to even all of us contemplate what innovation really is and to question, is the thing we are doing truly innovative or is it just something incremental on that which is already known and that's what which is already done? Now, I'll, I'll use an example. Just releasing your next variant of a smartphone or any other product or gadget, I would, don't regard that as innovation or innovative or just because you work in blockchain or artificial intelligence doesn't necessarily mean that you're innovative. I think you have to be thinking about innovation as, and I think a very good definition that I like to use is that it has to be something new and it has to be something impactful. And if it isn't the combination of both those things, then I question if it's truly innovative or true innovation. So I think the, the first thing around the culture of innovation, when, when I think about it is to, really understand what innovation is and how might I want to leverage true innovation to change my business or the world in a more disruptive way, we'll say. I mean, when I say disruptive, again, that's a bit of an overused term, but I mean non-incremental. Think in terms of 10x rather than, you know, 
1x or 2x. That's the, that's kind of what we're talking about there. So I think that's a starting point is just to question what is innovation. And then beyond that, I think a lot about, you know, that innovation is not business as normal. And I'm doing some research with a collaborator called Holly O'Driscoll at the moment. And we're thinking about the fact of why does it take a crisis to unlock innovation? Why is it that things can be built and made at speed in a crisis, but they can't otherwise? What is it that, what is it about regulation and rules and procedures and processes that kind of break down in a crisis and that allows us to unlock innovation? And why can't we do that when it's not, when we're not operating in crisis mode? And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about innovation and there's lots of business as usual approaches and processes that just kill innovation and i happily talk to people at length about that but I, I think you have to understand that innovation is not business as normal innovation is not just r d it's actually something fundamentally different to those and highly complementary but you have to know what it is and you have to understand how it might drive value for your business i mean this is really great to have that that definition of it and thank you and it's it's basically when you said r d research and development i mean really truly how deeply do you think um let's say corporates you um international corporations have really felt really spent the time on deep research and not just research in certain you know everyone keeping in their lane is there times when they also go into that lateral thinking where it's like let's bring in um a more mixed bag of of of, of, of let's say diversity cognitive diversity so we, what's what's some of the elements that we should be looking for in our in our families in in our in our businesses and maybe even for our countries in healthcare and all that is critical here. What what's kind of the secret sauce to kind of build a team that is promoting innovation or is looking to go exponential or solutioning at that level? Yeah, I think you know you mentioned it there. Cognitive diversity, I think, is a very important topic, and it's probably a little bit buzzy in, in modern times. It's become a kind of a buzzy topic for leadership, but I truly believe in it. And, you know, people talk about the importance of diversity in business and, of course, diversity in life. And often diversity can be about um, women, men, parity in, in business and bringing in, you know, broader sexual orientations and perspectives. But we often in the business world look at diversity through a very limited range or lens as well, like we do with everything else in life. When I think about diversity, I think about cognitive diversity. I think ultimately that is what you're trying to achieve, right? You want different perspectives, different way of thinking, different way of experience in the world, different way of solving problems. So cognitive diversity is what you're actually looking for. And cognitive diversity comes through what I would call diversity of everything. So in other words, you want to have the broadest set of perspectives that are adding to whatever it is that you're, the problem you're trying to solve. So when I look at this, I've done a lot of work, especially in the last few years, working with the artistic community, because I view the differences in the way technology through engineering and science are developed versus the way artists think about the world and solve problems as being the two most extremes you could possibly have across any two different disciplines on the planet. And when I've worked at trying to bring those two different worlds together, uh, and I can talk about the hardship and the pain and also the joy when you can achieve that, but it's, it's quite difficult because they're two vastly different perspectives and different ways of communicating in different worlds. But when you can bring them together, magic happens. And I view that as like an explosion of the concept of cognitive diversity. It's that ability to bring those immensely different perspectives from immensely different backgrounds, different ways of thinking about the world, different uh, ethnicities, different cultural backgrounds, different religious, different uh, training in college, whether it's philosophical, scientific, musical or otherwise it's that um, collision of all those differences where i see all the value and another kind of mantra that i have is that i truly believe that the future of innovation lies at the intersection of art and technology and it's because of the fact that when you bring the worlds together and if you can do it well that's where magic happens and that's where i believe the future of innovation and therefore also the future of humanity lies so yeah cognitive diversity is a critically important 
concept, which you can't just look to hire a few different people with different orientations and magically then expect your business is going to run differently. You have to hire sensibly. You have to bring in the right different perspectives. You have to bring in people with the right attitudes, openness, adaptiveness, need for collaboration inherently in them. And then you need to build structures around them such that you promote that and that they can actually come together and co coalesce and drive value from that. But what, one of the big worries I have in modern business world is that someone reads an article in Harvard Business Review as an example, and it says, you know, increase your diversity and your revenues increase by 13%. But they never talk about the absolute pain and hardship and the difficulties in bringing in true diversity into your organization. How do you foster that? How do you cultivate that? How do you put structures around that? And how do you help people get the most out of each other in this way? And that is actually very difficult. And that's something you need to think deeply about. I mean, the, the fusion of art and technology, I mean, the different hemispheres, besides, as you said, all the different other cognitive religion and, 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 and learning styles and all of those things. Um, our culture hasn't been structured to have that level of deep exploration on um, basically um, it's like like research for research um, basically uh, purposes or that putting that fusion together and see what compound comes out you know how are we going to have to change it differently obviously we can't go by quarterly returns and how can we as our you know in a, in a, as in a micro because we're all every one of us has some sort of crisis that we're trying to 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 pivot on or to uh, to, to 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 move forward in this this age of covid um how would you how would you set up is there like a venn diagram like first of all have a padded room and then have someone translating what every term means because there is that language difficulty um how success is measured uh, all these what are some of the, the, the techniques that you found to strip away some of our cultural biases or let's say our, our prejudices towards you know what's what's good business or what's you know gonna make money and, and really get people to the point where they can really meet peer to peer but coming from different places. Is there some sort of techniques that you've seen has worked in the past? Yeah, I can tell you directly from my own experience, not just in the art and technology program that I lead today, but also in other culture change initiatives that I've run in the past. And, and I think I'll give specifics, but I think this is transferable to anyone that is contemplating changing the organizational culture. But when you have two different perspectives or two different people or two different whatever, when you're trying to bring them together and we'll think about it through the lens of culture change, initially you need someone that can operate as that bridge between the two worlds. You need someone that can act as a translator, that can act as a mediator. You need someone that can speak in both of the both sides languages and you need someone that can do um, very sensible understanding of the perspectives, the history and that level of translational in real time to bring these different worlds together. So that's actually what I do largely in my role is that I, you know, select an artist, select some of our engineer scientists, think about who would be a good fit, think about all that terms like collaboration, adaptability, openness to new ideas, and a lot of other things I can talk about some other time. But then I would have to sit down with them initially and I have to be the one that introduces them, that shares the perspective, that does some initial translating and mediation between them. And then you need to step away from that, allow those folks to get to know each other, but you need to be regularly stepping back in, evaluating how things are going because when you have those differences coming together, sometimes those differences can explode into negatives because of miscommunication or misunderstanding and so on and so forth. So you have to have a person that acts in that translation mediator role that understands both sides of the equation. And they're critically important in any culture change initiative. Um, but I would say very much so when you're bringing these two different worlds together. Well, that's that's really it. I mean, it's, it, it has to be it has to be planned. It has to be encouraged. It has to be fostered. But I do have a tip because I have a, an acting background. I mean, I don't I don't act a theater background. Is a thing called theater sports. So if you watch your improvisations, and it's a great learning tool because the first rule in improvisation you can't say no, and you have to like play it forward and tell the truth. And it breaks down a lot of like, well, this is what I know. 
and it's usually around fun and being silly. We and back in the day, I used it as sales techniques, mm. listening, learning deeply how to listen, yeah. and deeply how to to well, we used to say hitchhike on each other's ideas. So it's breaking down our own, our artists are just a prejudiced in their in what their their belief is as an engineer. So it's really fusing a new human in a way, a, a deeper listening. Don't you think? Yeah, I, I think the the technique I think I've heard it said it's called yes and. So instead of saying no, but yes and just is a very simple verbal trick to change the perspective so that you take that positive angle at what has been said. And I think that's absolutely the key that what I find happens, in, and this is just human nature, it's very difficult to, to break this, but if you're conscious of it, you're on the winning side of the battle. But you need to understand that you you will filter everything that you experience and everything that everyone says to you through your own bubble of experience and through your own worldview and your own lens. And when someone else to, is coming to you with information, either in the positive or the negative, when they don't automatically fit into that worldview or that lens, you're gonna automatically start looking for reasons why that is the case. They're gonna start trying to attribute blame where it might not even exist and you start trying to attribute understanding from your perspective on what they mean when they might not mean that at all and i think when i talk about doing the translation and the mediation and you need that person to understand both sides of the equation the, the critical part of that is to help both sides understand that they're actually saying the same thing or effectively the same thing and they're actually thinking largely the same way it's just that they're using different words to describe it and have this this different base language through their experience and through their training you know if you take an engineer scientist versus an artist they typically have extremely different backgrounds and it's all about saying well you know you use this word and this expression here's what i think you mean because i know you and i know your approach and they would often say yeah that's exactly what i mean and then the artist will say oh well that makes complete sense from my perspective now because i thought you meant it in this totally different way so it's completely about openness to other perspectives Trying to look beyond just the words. Words themselves can be really deceptive things and you apply your own filter bubble and your own meaning to words and you need to kind of think beyond that and realize that the vast majority of people that we engage with don't have malice in mind. They're not coming at this purposely from a negative perspective. They're just coming at it from their perspective and it's up to both sides to try and understand each other. And that's really, in my view, the essence of culture design or culture change in organizations. I mean, people talk about all the various steps and stakeholder management and communication and everything, but it's really about understanding you're dealing with a person, you're dealing with a human being, an individual, and that you need to come at things from their perspective and treat them as a human being, not just another resource or employee number on your books. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I think this is the time for us and the big reset is maybe to reset, you know, our interpersonal communications and, and, and how we think and deal with each other as the first organic step that we can take charge of and then see where, you know, see where the collaboration goes. So thank you very much, Numenal, for joining us uh, today. And he's going to stick around uh, with our breakouts. And with that, I'll, I'll, put it, I'll send it back to you, Patrick. Great. Thanks, Marianne. Thanks for that conversation, guys. Um, so as, as I mentioned, just to, to roll on that, if, if anybody wants to kind of go deeper in some of the things that were discussed there, we've, Donal was most recently a guest in our podcast. He also has a great TED Talk um, that, was, that was released recently, which was a wonderful discussion about innovation and the work that he does at the Bell Labs. Uh, but now to bring in the community and bring in everybody's insights into it, I'm going to move us into breakout rooms where we're all going to get to move into discussions with each other in groups of three to four people. And we're going to go into these rooms for about five minutes. So before we do, I just want to ask if everybody who's on the call could turn on their video because it'll make it a nicer experience where you get to see each other as you, as you interact and move into the breakout rooms. And the, the question that I'm going to pose to everybody is to share a culture that inspires you. So, you know, a discussion that we've just had there is about culture and a culture of innovation, but I'd like you to share a culture that inspires you. And that could be something in relation to a business, a sports team, 
even a nation, um, anything that has given you some sense of inspiration. Uh, so we're going to move into breakout rooms for about five minutes, and then we'll come back into the into the larger group setting where we're going to hear from Jack Stenson and Louise O'Connor after that. Okay, so everybody's back in here. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that experience. I hope you got to have some nice conversations with the people in your group. And just so that we all get a perspective on what the conversations were, if everybody could just uh, drop in the chat box who you chose, who you chose is the culture that inspires you, um, just so that we can see what everybody had to bring to the table. Great to see such a diverse list. Here we go, Donal, on your topic of cognitive diversity. We're seeing an incredibly diverse list of all the, the different cultures that inspire people. Fantastic. So now we're gonna move into the, the second portion of this, of this, uh, this live virtual event. And I'm going to pass it over to the other side of the Atlantic, over to Jack Stenson, who is um, going to lead the way now in another interesting discussion that's going to be taking place with Louise O'Connor about digital transformation and the work that she's doing with Ireland together. So, Jack, I'm going to pass it over to you to, uh, to take the mantle from here. Thanks very much, Patrick. And uh, Duno, thanks very much for the opening bit. Really great stuff there. And led to me having a great chat with two ladies in the room there. Um, so Louise, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time uh, this evening. You're calling from Dublin, I'm in, I'm in London, uh, to chat to everyone here. Uh, I, I, to everyone's context, I uh, saw Louise, I, mean, I can't remember where I met you Louise, but I saw Louise post something on LinkedIn about two weeks ago about Ireland together. And I'm, I'm all about, um, uh, one, believing in, that, in the power of community, and two, in the ability for technology to be a force of positive disruption. Um, and uh, all that just spoke to me. I saw it all happening in Ireland together. Uh, so immediately I joined in. I got, you know, tried to learn more about this. Started speaking to Louise. Uh, joined a call, uh, and then I was like, "You have to come on to Digital Irish. We need to hear about this." So. Um, for the context for everyone else, Louise, uh, you also, Louise is also a partner in a uh, digital transformation consulting uh, challenger firm called Beta Digital. But um, if we begin with uh, Ireland together, uh, welcome to uh, Digital Irish Call. Can you tell us uh, what uh, irelandtogether.ie is all about? Uh, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, I think what Donal, so I was actually in one of the breakout sessions with Donal as well, so it was brilliant. I think we could brainstorm forever, so just as well there was a time limit on it. Um, yeah. So Ireland Together started about four weeks ago when a group of us, uh, like-minded kind of individuals jumped on a Zoom call, many of whom we hadn't met before in person, um, and just kind of we just started brainstorming how we could help companies through co like the current situation. Um, and it was f so about four weeks. It was just helping support kind of a different range of industries, different knowledge and skills, and all kind of the different everything. Donald was kind of mentioning before about collective collaboration. Um, eight days later, we had a website, a brand, a logo, content, social media channels, uh, licenses from all the big tech companies, and it moved faster than we could even, even imagine. Um, and there's still loads more to come. So it's so Ireland Together is a free nonprofit uh, business support community for businesses and people looking to offer and who need help and um, kind of for, for facing current challenges. But it's all about doing business together navigating new ways of doing things thinking differently of business models and doing it collaboratively collaboratively and collectively so uh, the goal is to pretty much collaborate connect and innovate um, and that word innovate is very well described by Donald earlier it's it's a way of how do you do something that is currently now and think outside the box, think differently of how it could be done in a different way. And how do you get that collective thinking with that shared belief um, to kind of drive economic recovery and sustain sustainability? 
Um, yeah, uh, Donald has a lot of great points. I was telling him about an hour ago that uh, I robbed one of his previous published articles on LinkedIn, where he said innovation is impact plus invention. Uh, and I robbed that for a load of uh, my own stuff in my day job. Um, but uh, in our, for Ireland Together, Dottie, um, so part of, when, when I joined uh, uh, the group to see what it was all about, part of it was in, involved doing a survey, which um, you, know, you can join as an advisor and give up some free time, or you can join as a member if you're looking for some advice on the challenges you might be facing. So um, when you, I joined the first call with the group, uh, by the way, Joanne Griffin, Colin Harris, and Mindy Castledon are three other co-founders who I've seen uh, are on the call here as well. So welcome to you guys as well. Um, but when people joined and they completed the survey, what were kind of the top uh, skills? No, so what, were the, what were the top challenges you were seeing from the members and what were the kind of corresponding uh, top skills that you were seeing uh, advisors um, listing uh, in those sort of surveys? So as this kind of only evolved and only went live about two weeks ago, we're still working on the whole mentor advisors members. So we're calling them all members at the moment um, because I think everyone joined as both to kind of give insights on what they could. And it is very much collaboration and uh, collective thinking. So a lot of what we were seeing was about 50% of the professionals were coming in reporting, communicating with their customers. How do they actually communicate? A lot of them weren't on digital. They didn't know how to do that followed by uh, cash flow financing and also isolation. There were a lot of people who had a lot of things to give and to help, but they felt isolated and didn't know how to communicate or have a network in order to do that. So that was one of the, the main challenges across the board, I'd say about 50%, if not more. Um, I think the other big stat was that nearly 42% weren't confident that they had support network or the ability to actually adapt. They just, they were stuck. They really didn't know where to start. Um, Across the range of industries, we had about 85% were kind of micro and small beat businesses, not too surprising, um, but also they're the ones who are open to asking questions and helping each other, I think, as well. So we had everything from fin um, finance, HR, technology, business services, um, marketing, internal communications, uh, remote working is a big thing. I know there's a huge hype, like I've been remote working for so many years, as many people in this group have been. Um, but when you actually have been doing it for so long and people go, so, so how do we do this Zoom thing? And uh, it, it's really interesting, the lack of digital knowledge, which we just take for granted when you've been doing it for so long. Um, so the, some of the expertise or advice that they were looking for, the predominant ones were, um, how do they change their business model? How do they pivot to something else? Um, how do they migrate their businesses online? Um, and how, who do they ask for that kind of advice? Like one of the big things about what we're trying to do is build an ecosystem that there's no competition because we'll promote any single other company out there. It's about bringing it all in one place that if you need funding advice, if you need, we have things from Enterprise Ireland, SFA, local enterprise centers. We have all the documentation linking back to theirs, but also uploaded. And we have people from across different sectors who are totally sector agnostic. The more diverse, the better. And we've actually already got over, uh, I think it's 23 different counties engaged in less than two weeks with over 200 members. And we've got, I think it's like 20, 30 different Slack channels of people just offering help, introducing each other, having chats, understanding where that's going to lead to, and how do we actually come up with different ways of doing business collectively. Um, and that is the big word that um, Donal, I think he stole all my vocabulary, by the way, but it's great that we're so aligned in so many ways of thinking of the diverse way of going. So um, I mean, we're going into that afterwards, but um, how do you collectively come up with different ideas for the same model? So I remember putting out recently that people could adapt, companies could adapt business models. And someone said, well, hold on, I'm doing work with salons. They can't do anything. I was like, okay, no, it's really tough but how about you move it online and you find a different way of people still need to do their hair. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do the nails. How do you, like, if they're interested and want to keep you afloat, um, it's a way of just thinking differently about how you do business. Absolutely. Um, and if you had one ask regarding IrelandTogether.e for the people on this call, what would that be? Uh, well, to register, but that isn't my ask. <laughs> um, to register, but to engage. I mean, people are sometimes afraid of showing that they don't know something or being afraid that they might advise something or not quite sure if people want to hear what they want to say. If the engagement piece is 
all ideas are welcome. It's it's the more that you throw out and the more that it's kind of sticking going, hold on, I didn't think of that. So I love the idea of associated thinking. It's where you take an idea that works in one business or one industry and how do you adapt that to another? It's, it's, it's mind blowing. And the more ideas you have for innovation is the way that you can actually drive new business ways. So yeah, so register, engage and just pay it forward. There's so many people who need help and there's so much knowledge out there. It's just that's the most important part. Yeah, I think it's uh, very important for people to think of this as an era of paying it forward at the moment uh, to make sure we all emerge uh, together. Um, brilliant initiative. Um, so if we get more on to your, uh, day, your day job, um, which is uh, in, in the world of uh, digital, tr digital transformation, um, how, can you talk more about uh, your, your background on that? So my day job, I don't know what's day and night or weeks or weekdays anymore. Um, so I've been digitally enabling and transforming companies for the last 20 years. Um, it's looking at long before it became a buzzword or that it was even a buzzword. It was taking companies that were offline and how do they do diff business differently? So I grew up in an age without digital. First company was a uh, innovative leader well, after the United Nations, another innovative leader just going, okay, you know, this internet thing, maybe we could just find a new way of doing something. So we actually did. And we set up one of the first e-learning kind of courses versions without LMSs or e-commerce or anything. It was taking packages and uploading it to intranet sites and then saying, let's distance learning PPC campaigns and try to get people to do things. They'd phone up with the credit card details and um, suddenly they were able to do it at a distance learning, which is now e-learning, um, which didn't exist at the time. So it was from the very onset that it was just ingrained in me to think of things differently and I think also like Donal and Mary there's a lot of um, overlap between the arts and music like I studied piano for years lived in different countries speak languages there's there's just a different way when you when you're so used to change that your mind just goes into that like I would get bored being somewhere too long if there wasn't another challenge and another challenge as many people will ad ad agree with me on this call I can see Mary McKenna nearly smiling going yes she is she's laughing so it's always been that case I suppose I moved country so often building digital capability I started companies across all different sectors from startups to SMEs to multinationals with the United Nations it was kind of working across SaaS technology learning um, FMCG e-commerce all of the different elements if you're looking at change it doesn't really matter it's industry and sector agnostic it's looking at how could you do something differently and adapting what you already know to a different environment so um, I returned from London so uh, about four, it's almost four years ago. And I started working with a couple of startups. I'm mentoring for Enterprise Ireland and that's exciting because you get so many ideas thrown at you that you have no idea who's coming on the call. You have no idea what their challenges or their industry and you're on the spot to think of new ways and understanding, well, what are you doing? Who are you looking to, to connect with or sell to? Um, and then how do you do that online? So. Enterprise Island then, um, so I'm still mentoring with them. And then I was finishing up in a company which is recruitment technology and um, all remote working. And I was introduced to two of my partners, one of whom I believe is on the call. And um, he said this, I knew somebody is doing something in that digital transformation space. And again, most people don't understand digital transformation. It's literally just adapting what is to what can be through digital means. It's taking an existing model, understanding how you can do something, adapt it and change. Um, so met with a business partner and I said, no way am I going near startups, I'm going to a multinational and I'm never touching startups again, as many people can testify to me saying. And instead I ended up setting my, up my own consultancy with these two partners in digital transformation, uh, which is brilliant. But I think one of the changes, um, one of the challenges we were talking about in one of the breakout sessions was it's too big and digital transformation was seen as a nice to have when I came back to Ireland. Um, it was one of those things that were like, oh yes, no, we'll, we'll, we'll do that or we'll, we'll talk about that in future. And suddenly overnight, people had to find a different way. It was a matter of survival. It wasn't a nice to have anymore. Like companies need to survive and they need to connect. Um, and I suppose because I've been doing that for so long, suddenly people went, oh, Louise is in that digital space. Maybe we should reach out to her. And still not fully understanding, but understanding that it's about changing models and changing businesses. So sure. that's kind of my background. 
Great. Um, so yeah, no, I think that line, what it is to what it can be, is is a brilliant way to sum up digital transformation. Um, currently, I'm working in an intelligent automation company, and what we're trying to do is get people to think not just about what uh, the paper and manual process that they have, and then to digitize this, but think what it, what could it be? So why create a digital copy and paste or carbon copy version when you can uh, create a, a, a bold new world that you you can live in? Um, so what are the main, if you could, given that we have probably f uh, four minutes left in the slot now, what are the main challenges that you see in the companies you deal with? Or what are the main challenges you think companies are dealing with now in particular, uh, especially the ones who may be a little bit less mature in their digital transformation? Um, so what, are you, what, would you, what are you seeing? What, what do you think the challenges are? So I did warn you, you and I could talk for ages, for hours about this, so try to yes. condense it. I think it's the fear of the unknown, the fear of change, um, not knowing where to start. How, how do you suddenly change something you've been doing for X amount of time and change it into an environment that nobody's ever seen before or experienced? And there is no prerequisite to go, how do we do this? So digital know-how and implementation is another big challenge. It's it's one of those things that was on the list to do, like remote working. I spoke to a company who had a policy ready to go, and it's completely obsolete now because it was about blended uh, working from home one day a week, whereas suddenly it's five days a week. So it's looking at how do you change your business model? How do you change processes? How do you communicate not only with customers, but with your employees? How do you bring them on the journey? Um, which is so important in digital transformation, any change. People um, are scared, and there's a lot of anxiety. and I think what was said earlier, there's also a lot of opportunity to make really positive changes. If you look at the tech for good sector, as I said, I'm going to stop talking now because I'm talking too much. But if you look at that sector of the changes people are making that are affecting people's lives, that's real change and innovation. Back to what Donald was saying as well before. Okay, um, and uh, just uh, conscious that some people in the States in particular might have meetings at 2 p.m. in 10 minutes, so we don't want to take up too much of the, the break room uh, interactive part. Um, I, I had a, a longer question for you, and I'm going to try and shorten it. Um, if uh, you were to throw one tip out to people to make lasting uh, change regarding digital transformation. So to think about, we have an opportunity now as we're changing everything to change how we also work when we all emerge from uh, lockdown. So if you had any thoughts on it could be culture or what is your tip on making lasting change? So successful. <laughs> it's collective thinking and collaboration. It is looking at taking time to stop. A lot of people are just adding technology at a, at a faster rate, which isn't going to solve anything. So stop, take heed and understand what you're trying to achieve and what is your why. Embrace the change that's happening and reach out to people and form that kind of understanding of how to do things differently and bring people on the journey. It's the most important part or you will lose people. Brilliant. Uh, Louise, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us and I wish you and your three other co-founders the best of luck with uh, Ireland you. Together. And hopefully I'll be along for some of the journey. Um, Patrick, back to you. Cheers, Jack. I love this. We're kind of like uh, throwing the baton across the Atlantic back and forth. I can do the uh, weather as well for Golden Bay. <laughs> thing, you know? I'll get a green screen for the next one. Um, so, yeah, we want to be conscious that everybody can be off this by two if you do have to take calls or meetings. But before we do, I'd love if everybody could. Um, we're, we're going to move into another breakout room where we can share our thoughts and insights with each other. And uh, the question in this, in this moment is if you, you could share a resource or resources which have been extremely helpful for you or for your company as you've had to go through this period of living everything uh, digitally. So that could be, you know, could, it could be an expert of somebody who's been able to give you kind of a transformation of thought on how you think about things or a piece of software or a community that you've been able to tap into, but something that's been uh, profoundly helpful for you or your business or your team at this time. And if you could, if you could share that with the with the group of people that you're going to move into, into uh, this breakout room. So I'm going to recreate the breakout room. So you're going to move into a new group of people, have new interactions, and uh, we're just going to do this for five minutes, and then we'll have a little bit of a, a recap when we come back from this. Okay, so we're all back in the hot seat. Um, we're back in the mix. If everybody just once again, just to, so that we can all benefit from each other's knowledge and know-how. If you could share what you shared in the group just in the chat bar, 
So just below uh, your screen, you will see, or your face, you'll see um, a chat box and you can enter in what resource you mentioned. Um, and that way, anybody who's on this will get a chance to see it. Uh, but all in all, I want to say a huge thank you. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody for, for uh, being so, you, giving us your time to come and join us, to be part of this. The, the whole idea of these events that we run with Digital Irish is to bring people together to hopefully learn from people who can share something of value at this time, but also learn from each other and interact with each other because what's fundamental is that we all get to interact and uh, get to connect with each other as a community. And this is uh, strangely a golden opportunity for us where we had events in London and events in New York, and now we get to merge everybody together in, in, one, in one space. So thank you everybody for connecting. And I hope you get a chance to meet some new people who you didn't know before you came into this call, who you got to connect with and we'll be able to further those conversations. And um, before we close it out entirely, I want to leave it to Mary Ann. Do you, do you have any final words before we close this out to share with everybody? Well, I want to thank everyone for their generosity um, and for coming and, uh, and then for participating, especially for Louise and Dumnall for a very last minute, uh, put this together. I want to thank the Digital Irish Board for, um, we all kind of forced ourselves down this rabbit hole. And I think that it's by our experience and our learning to work together and our different backgrounds that we came up to this. So we want to hear from you. We want to hear ideas. We want to hear what you're looking for, what you need, uh, suggestions for programmings and for master class, obviously. You know, we used to put all of our money and effort on, you know, food and beverage and, uh, you know, rental space we didn't because we had a great, a great sponsorship with the Bank of Ireland. So now we're much more agile. And I think that maybe in the ways that we can really expand the whole motion of promoting Irish innovation and, and innovation in general. So we're just more agile. And I think that we can, we can, we need your ideas and, and your solutions so that we can like come out of this better. So um, watch the social media space and, uh, you know, watch our email blasts and, uh, and Gavin and, and Fergal just joined our really fun Breffney's down to masterclass. And, you know, we're, we'd love to get more of these thought leadership uh, programs out also. So thank you all again for like your time and, and your participation.